All right, Deb, thank you very much. Um, it, it, I think I'm screen sharing successfully here if you're looking at my, my title page. Uh, I've been told by the organizers, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, the DC Quantum Computing Meetup uh, folks for inviting me to this. Um, I've um, really looking forward to this particular discussion today um, and, and I appreciate the invitation. And I've been told that the best way to deal with question and answers during this particular session is to use the little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen right now, uh, as opposed to chat or any other mechanism, I'll be able to see the, the, the questions as they pop up and hopefully we'll have time to get to all of them. I don't plan on speaking for two hours. I wouldn't do that to anybody, um, but I will be available for questions and answers as, as, they, do, as they do come in. Um, so we might as well just get started then. Um, as, as Deb told me, and, and thanks for that introduction, Deb, really what I'm gonna talk about today is, is quantum computing finding its place in the advanced computing sector writ large. Um, and let me just see, there we go. Uh, I come from a company called Hyperion Research and, and this is not a commercial uh, for the company as much as it is a, a little explanation of our pedigree. So you understand, uh, you know, kind of the optics of how we come to, to, to look at the quantum computing question. Uh, essentially Hyperion Research, if you're familiar with IT consulting world, uh, we came out of a larger company called IDC, International Data Corporation, about three years ago, where the high-performance computing team, about five or six of us, uh, you know, felt it was time to kind of move off and, and really start to look at what was going on in the advanced computing sector without having to deal with IDC's definitions and rigor when it came to how they looked at particular products and, and markets and customers and such. And so we, we, we wanted to kind of break out onto our own. So we've, we've had a good, a good uh, you know, run over the last few years. We've brought on a couple new analysts, but really what's allowed us to do is in some sense be much more reactive to some of the more interesting developments in the advanced computing field. Um, and, and, and what happened was as we kind of broke out, what we noticed that our, our traditional high performance computing client base, which is composed primarily of either high performance computing suppliers, and there you'd have the usual suspects, you'd have HPE, Cray, and, and Dell, and, 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 and some of the European and, and say Japanese vendors, as well as uh, HPC user community. And that could be the commercial sector or within government or academia, and that has a global uh, influence there as well. Well, from both those sides of the coin, from the computational side, we start to get questions about, we're hearing things about quantum computing. We, we know it offers some opportunities, we know it presents some challenges, but we wanna know how it's going to impact our existing and planned plans, if you will, for HPC development from the supply side and also from the user side. And the questions became very pointed in terms of how do we prepare? What's gonna be the upheavals? Is there gonna be some sort of uh, you know, changes that we need to adjust to? What is the time frame? And perhaps most importantly, how do we figure out how to formulate policy to deal with this? Because the fundamental reality from both the HPC user and supplier side is there's an awful lot of confusion right now about what's going on in quantum computing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit more in the future. Uh, but the bottom line is that the advanced computing sector, the sector that is, is earmarked, is, is, is literally famous for adopting the newest and greatest technologies that become available to, to drive this continual need for the highest levels of performance, sometimes without much attention being paid to the price, it, it, it is interested in this technology and wants to see how they can take advantage of it. And so really what we're trying to do is figure out at its most uh, you know, basic level, how does quantum computing fit into the traditional classical HPC world? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? Let me just give a quick background of what you know we call advanced computing, which right now is, is pretty much dominated by classical high performance computers and such. Uh, I, in 2020, we're looking at this technical computing sector being worth about $24 billion in total. And that's, that's hardware and software and professional services and such. Now, if I gave this briefing say five or 10 years ago, I would have defined technical computing as traditional classical modeling and simulation the kinds of programs that if you're designing airflow, if you're designing a new wing at Boeing and you wanna know about airflow over a new wing or in a, a complete airframe, you'd be doing you know, standard mathematical equations. Uh, if you're looking at car crashes, if you're 
if you're designing, say, a new race car, or if you're designing how to, how to design uh, a new wheel uh, to optimize airflow on a bicycle, and you want to think of new and interesting spoke designs, you would think about using classical uh, HPC. Uh, but however, more recently, the sector has expanded to include a number of different workloads that complement this traditional mod sim world. And there, the first one is, is, is big data analysis. The idea that there's an awful lot of big data out there, large data sets, diverse data sets that may be audio, it may be video, it may be integer, uh, it may be floating point, it may be Twitter feeds, uh, diverse data sets that need to be analyzed to reach some interesting conclusions. And, and that offers some interesting challenges to the, to, the, to the traditional mod sim world, but it's also something that the HPC world has embraced pretty aggressively. The third new, the, the second new and third leg of what now uh, composes the, the advanced computing realm is uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the idea of using HPCs as uh, training vehicles uh, to look at, uh, to, to basically host a lot of the new AI, deep learning, machine learning kinds of algorithms that basically consume lots, lots of data and ultimately in their underlying uh, governing equations are doing nothing more than some relatively straightforward matrix math, but they're doing an awful lot of it and they're doing it with big data sets. So kind of the three legs now of technical computing consist of the mod sim, the traditional mod sim, uh, some, some recent forays into big data and, and the new kind of front edge of, of high performance computing, which is um, um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. The key to that artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning phenomena is the rise of uh, GPUs, the, the kinds of systems that you, uh, the kind of components that you see, say, from a company like NVIDIA, which say 10 years ago were doing image processing, have now been converted for use in high, high computational uh, applications. If you look at uh, one of the most powerful HPCs in the world right now, the, the, the um, Summit system at Oak Ridge National Lab, 95% of the cycles, the performance capability of that system is GPU-based, not CPU-based. And that was something that, say, five years ago, no one had even seen. And, and what's happened is the entire sector has grabbed on the GPUs uh, as, as a way to address a new and interesting set of workloads. And I use that almost as, a, as a, an exemplar in how the, the, the advanced computing sector can basically switch gears very quickly. Uh, GPUs came along, there was an interesting compelling workload, a work case scenario, and a lot of the organizations jumped on that very quickly. And, and I think a lot of the HPC users are wondering if quantum computing is going to offer the same kind of new workloads, new use cases, and, 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 and react the same way that they have reacted over time to interesting technology developments in the classical side. So that's the, that's the first bullet, believe me, that's not scale to how I'm gonna go move through this. The bottom line is the technical computing world is driven by the highest end performance, just for some, some gee whiz numbers. Uh, the fastest HPC in the world today is it's a system called Fugaku. Uh, for those that are interested, that is the Japanese name for Mount Fuji uh, in Japan, which is not only the highest mountain in Japan, which is why they picked that name, but it also has an incredibly broad base. And that was one of the major design philosophies behind Fugaku. It was going to be able to address a wide number of applications, address all the existing workloads that I talked about earlier, mod sim, big data, and AI, uh, with equal uh, aplomb. And, and so they designed that system to be very, very flexible. And to do that, they had to incur a cost of about $1.1 billion. So that, that machine that sits right now at a, a research center in Japan, Rikin, who, by the way, gave me the shirt. I didn't even realize this. Um, that machine right now is capable of producing on average about 513 petaflops. What that means is that that's 513 times 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second. Uh, and that's really kind of the, the hallmark that's the, makes it pretty much the fastest machine in the world, um, but not for long because where there's something out there called exascale systems, exascale being the next order of uh, three orders of magnitude. So we move from petaflops 10 to the 15th to exascale, 10 to the 18th uh, floating point operations per second. And right now there are a number of systems that are available uh, in development that will probably hit the market in the next one or two years that'll hit this exaflop range. Uh, the big three that we're looking at most with most interest right now are all coming out of US Department of Energy Office of Science and uh, National Nuclear Security Agency procurements 
going into places like Oak Ridge, Lawrence Livermore, and Argonne. Each of those systems is budgeted at about $600 million a piece uh, and are targeted for one to 1.5 to two um, uh, exaflops within the next 18, 18 months to two years as those systems roll out. Uh, the interesting thing there you'll notice is that somehow the Department of Energy managed to completely undercut the cost of what the Fugaku and Japan system cost. The key issue there is that these systems are, as I mentioned earlier, highly GPU dependent. A lot of their cycles come from GPU performance. That gives you a lot of performance, but it ultimately limits the range of applications that you can achieve this theoretical peak number of exaflop rating. And so really what, what it means is that some of those systems, because of their pricing choices, because they wanted to keep the price at a relatively inexpensive $600 million, had to make some choices about what they had to do in terms of hardware configuration. The emphasis was on GPUs. For certain jobs that are GPU friendly, that means they're gonna run like crazy. For jobs that require unique characteristics that are only available on say a CPU, that gives you a certain amount of constraints. And, and so there are always trade-offs here, uh, but that just gives you a sense of the dynamics of what's going on in the, in the HPC sector writ large. Now just by way of overall introduction, um, the promise of quantum computing, bringing it back down to the, the, what I was supposed to be talking about tonight, is, is substantial. And, and, and clearly QC systems have the potential to exceed the performance of conventional computers for a wide range of applications. And here we talk about physical simulation in areas like material science, chemistry, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas. There's, there's definitely been an emphasis on machine learning capabilities in quantum and also what's going on in the world of optimization. Now, I'll tell you that what's interesting here is that these are the list of interesting applications from the quantum computing side. It has a near one-to-one -one mapping in terms of what traditional classical HPCs are, are working on today as well. The, certainly within the commercial sector, uh, things like pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, chemistry, finance are all big HPC users, and which is why there's a, there's a real interest in terms of confluence here. How can these users take advantage of some of the same use cases that quantum seems to be targeted towards? So there's a real interesting confluence of capability here that I think creates a natural mutual benefit between classical HPC and, 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 and the quantum systems that we're looking at. The key here is that literally every day there is, there is a new potential use case or application or algorithm being developed in quantum. So this list is, is one that is expansive, but, but increases in granularity on a near continual basis. Um, one of the things that you'll hear an awful lot about when people start talking about quantum computing is this idea of quantum supremacy. And Quite simply, what that really means is the ability to use a programmable quantum device to solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in any feasible amount of time. And in some cases, that may be feasible amount of time may be something like the, the length that the universe has existed. Uh, and, and, and that is a major goal that you'll hear when you talk to quantum computing folks. And we're going to add a little bit of context to that as we move along. But I just want to give you a sense of the reality of quantum computing when we do look at something perhaps as even simple as factoring a large number into its two prime integers. This is Shor's algorithm. If you're even vaguely familiar with quantum computing, you'll, you'll hear someone talk about Shor's algorithm at some point, because this is really the, the, the QC exemplar. This is, this is the algorithm that generated so much initial interest and demonstrated clearly the potential of quantum computing to do things that were just simply not possible on a classical counterpart. And what you have here is a chart that, that, that looks at two different sets of algorithms, both of them whose goal is to, to basically uh, divide a, a, a number into its prime factors, a simple example being 15, breaking it down into five and three, five and three both being prime numbers. So if you look at the bottom, you'll see on the x-axis, we have 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, it's a log scale. And it tells you how many bits are in that prime number that you're trying to factor, moving from 100 to 1,000 to 100,000. And right now, if you look at, um, and we'll get into why those, those numbers are important, uh, but if you look at how long it takes that NFS, that, that number field sieve classical algorithm, how long it takes to factor certain numbers as a function of the number of bits in the original um, uh, prime number number, um, you'll see that it goes up rather quickly. So as I move from say 
uh, let's let's just pick a number, say one, two, three, four hundred uh, bits, and it takes about a month if you're using basically a uh, 2003 level uh, computer on an NSF algorithm. Um, you can see there it takes about where it crosses that one horizontal line of say one year. Uh, you're only at about five or six hundred bits. Well, if you push out to a thousand bits on that same system, you're now talking, you're moving through quickly through 10 years, 100 years, a thousand years, and a million years. And once you get past, say, a couple thousand bits, you're, you're moving into a billion years to factor those things. Now, the interesting thing about Schroeder's algorithm isn't how quickly it can solve prime factoring. It's what is important about prime factoring. And, and, and quickly, without going into too much detail, the idea of being able to take a large number and, and factor it into its two primes is a critical element in a large number of, of, of encryption schemes that are used today to protect data and, and, and transmission throughout basically the entire IT universe. Uh, a lot of it's, it's, it's basically called public private key encryption. And the key thing is you basically have great difficulties. It's very easy to generate a, a multiple of two prime numbers, it's much more difficult to factor it. And that inequality is used as a basis for a lot of encryption algorithms out there today, which is why, uh, one of the reasons why that was, that was so favored was that vertical chart there, that, that uh, traditional uh, number fields of algorithm, because people knew that if I had a, a prime factor of, of only a few thousand bits, it was virtually unbreakable by today's traditional computers. Well, along comes Shore with its algorithm in, in 1995. And if you look at those gently sloping horizontal lines, and they'll, they'll just, those, those four numbers tell you a little bit about the, the basically the clock rate from one hertz to one gigahertz of a particular um, algorithm that Shore de de described in some of his, his, his seminal work. And you'll see that now at a thousand bits, what would have taken a classical computer more than a year to factor, Shor's algorithm can do in less than a hundred seconds. But perhaps more important is when I move to 10,000 bits, I've now moved completely out of the realm of what goes on in the classical world. Again, we've exceeded the time it would take if, if, if the computer had started the run at the beginning of the, the Big Bang, it'd still be running today. Yet a one gigahertz Shor's quantum system would have finished that calculation in about an hour. And again, it's not just the demonstrated speed up capability here. The concern and the interest within Shor's algorithm was the fact that it could literally break um, almost all the encryption algorithms that were currently in vogue and are still used today predominantly. Now the spoiler alert for all this is that there's more than one way to encrypt systems. And uh, this public private key phenomena, the prime number factoring algorithm is not the only way to do those kinds of things. And there are what we call post-quantum encryption schemes. So when you hear stories in the open press about next week, someone's gonna be able to read all your email or quantum computers break all encryption algorithms, that's not exactly true. Uh, first off, the, the research into actually building quantum computer systems that, that implement Shor's algorithm is not that terribly interesting from a computer uh, from a quantum computer researcher's perspective. So it's not something that people are looking at all that aggressively. As I mentioned, there are a number of post-quantum algorithms already under development, already being looked at by national governments. So it, it's not the end of the world, but it's something that at my mind is at least interesting to look at in terms of clearly defining kind of the potential advantage of quantum computing, this issue of quantum supremacy, a kind of incarnate here in this simple, this simple graphic. Well, quickly, I just want to go over just, just some phrases for folks who, who may not be familiar. What, well, what makes quantum computers different? What drives this, this, this potentially um, awe-inspiring kind of capability and performance improvements? And the, the bottom line is it really comes out into two uniquely quantum computer effects. First one is superposition, which quite simply allows a qubit to have a value of not just one or zero, like a binary digit, a bit does, but really to maintain both states at the same time, or at least some probabilistic state somewhere between one and zero at the same time, which enables a certain amount of simultaneous computation. You can examine a number of different states at the same time, which would have re required you to expressly state all those states distinctly and uh, discreetly in a binary zero and one world. The other aspect is something called entanglement. Entanglement allows one of these little qubits that's in this superposition state to share its states with others separated in space. 
create a, a sort of super super position. And then here, here's where you get this increased process capability where the more qubits that you add, every time you add a qubit, you literally double your processing capability. So a 10 qubit system is, is twice as powerful as a nine qubit system and so on. So the, 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 the capabilities of a quantum system go up as you add more qubits in this entangled state. That's really great. And those phenomena uh, have, been, have been noted and analyzed like crazy uh, over the years from a physics and mathematics standpoint. The, the fundamental reality though is establishing and maintaining these quantum superposition and tangle states are exceedingly difficult to do. They require some very esoteric physics. They create programming nightmares. They create, they, some of them require the need for, for very harsh environments that very low temperatures below that of, of, of what you'd find if you stepped out of a spacecraft out beyond the orbit of Pluto, uh, or they, they, they have to be isolated uh, electrically, mechanically, magnetically. It's a, it's a very delicate state. And right now there are a number of different ways that people are building quantum computers to establish this quantum superposition and entanglement. And it's, it, it's, there, there's many, many different kinds of options out there. And no one has agreed on yet if we've reached the best option or what even the best option may be. So there's lots of lots of work to be done in terms of building a quantum system that can support these two issues of superposition uh, and entanglement. So let me just give you a little flavor of the complexity, what we're dealing with now, because the, the issue of quantum is not, it, 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 it requires an end-to-end -end perspective on how you do these kinds of calculations. So on the top left of the screen there, we kind of give you a sense of, this is a classic, the left, the, the one and the zero is your classic probabilistic bit. It can either be pointing up with representing a zero, or pointing down, representing a one. The counterpart to that is, is, is what they call a block sphere, which is a quantum bit, which can basically be positioned anywhere on a three-dimensional sphere. Uh, that ultimately can have all sorts of complexities to it. It has probabilities associated with it and that you process it in that state, that the qubit exists somewhere on the surface of that sphere and it interacts and that's where you get a lot of your, 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 your basic performance capabilities. So if you wanted to do something with that on a quantum system, you just don't throw it into a quantum machine and get out an answer. You have to go through a simple process, which means you start out with a classical input. Uh, because we live in a classical world and that's where the input has to come from. And so here we're just going to run a simple experiment and say, okay, I'm going to feed into my quantum system from my classical input world three zeros. That's all I'm going to do, zero, zero, zero. And what I'm going to do, my program, if you will, that I'm going to have the quantum computer execute, for the first zero, I'm going to execute nothing. It's just going to be basically a wire that goes through the system. The second bit is going to go through a simple NOT gate. We're just going to convert a zero to a one. The third qubit, we're going to do that twice. We're going to insert it into our quantum world. We're going to run it through a NOT gate. We're going to run it through a NOT gate. So in a classical world, we would accept, we would expect that we're going to get a zero, one, zero. Now, the problem here is we, we get it into this quantum state and we have all the quantum goodness I talked about earlier, superposition, entanglement, we deal with the, the logic gates. But remember the complexities of superposition and entanglement and the fundamental physics of quantum means that there's, there's just the probability of errors at every step of the way. There can be errors introduced when I feed in the zeros. The, the quantum system may not see a zero when it gets there. It may be in some odd angle somewhere on that block sphere in a different proportion that creates concerns. The calculations themselves, something as simple as a not gate introduces errors. And then of course the readout, again, the same phenomena. We may not exactly get the exact, the exact answer we want. So to deal with that at this particular point in time, we're, the, the, the community is thinking about ways to do error correction, the simple kind of error correction that we've come to expect in the classical world. You know, you may have eight bits of, of, of ones and zeros and you have two extra bits to detect and correct errors. Error correction overheads in quantum right now is much more um, severe in terms of overhead. You may need thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of, of noisy quantum bits to develop one very reliable logical bit. But the bottom line is what we do today in the sector is we run shots, multiple shots to get our answers. And this output that I get that you see here on the right is that quantum block sphere, because when I come out of my state of quantum goodness, it has to come out and, be, and exist in the classical world. So that block sphere must 
collapse into classical ones and zeros. So the only output you can actually get from a quantum system is a classical binary one or zero. So all of the quantum goodness that you have, you don't carry with you once you actually do things like read the results, try to store them, try to copy them. They all collapse back to the classical world. Well, if you look at this output here, this is the result of our simple three transition state phenomena. Uh, it was run on an IBM Q uh, system up in New York um, a while ago, and we ran 8,000 shots on it. And this is the probability distribution function that we got out of that. Well, it's really nice to know that we got the right answer about 90% of the time, but that means we got the wrong answer about 10% of the time. And more importantly, we had to run the calculation 8,000 times to get an answer that would lead us to believe this is statistically valid. So, so there's, there's your quantum goodness requires a certain amount of repetition to get results that are reasonable. And this is one of the more uh, pernicious programs right now, or pernicious issues right now in quantum computing is this idea of how complicated it really is to, to, to basically take an interesting problem reduce it to a series of relatively simple classical inputs, convert it into the quantum world, do the complex calculations, and then watch it collapse back into this cl uh, traditional classical output of ones and zeros in a way that is statistically valid and gives you answers that you can trust. So that just gives you a little flavor uh, of, of, of the, um, you know, what's, what's really facing someone when they're thinking about programming in a quantum world. And so if I, haven't, if I haven't belabored the point too much, let me just say it one more time. There are substantial challenges ahead within the quantum computing sector. The formidable technical issues in quantum hardware, I talked about the noise issue. It's a really tough problem. Error correction is not the overnight solution to this. It may take years to reach a, a situation where someone can actually build a million qubit system that has sufficient error correction to be of the kind of reliability that allows you to run programs that are reproducible and predictable and you can validate and verify. That may be years, if not decades off. The same issue exists in some sense with some of the software that going, that, that's out there right now. People aren't very good at thinking about quantum algorithms. There's a certain amount of vagary involved in them, a certain amount of theoretical underpinnings that are hard to, to, to really quantify yet. And, and, and you compare that with 40 or 50 years of experience and skill sets in classical algorithms and, and how sophisticated some of those have become, you start to think that quantum computing algorithms have really just entered their earliest stage of development. It shows huge promise, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uncertain performance gains are another interesting aspect. I talked about Shor's algorithm demonstrating quantum superiority. Today, the bulk of quantum computing algorithms that are out there do not clearly demonstrate theoretical potential for quantum superiority. And in many cases, they only demonstrate the ability for a certain amount of quantum speed up, which may be perhaps orders of magnitude, in some cases only a linear speed up of, of, of compared to classical counterparts. So the jury's really still out in terms of what are the actual range of algorithms out there that quantum computing can demonstrate tangible performance gains versus classical, uh, classical counterparts. There's a huge issue here with unclear timeframes. This is not an engineering problem as of yet. I mentioned the fact that implementing qubits right now is still out, the jury's still out on modality. Which is the best one? Is it superconducting qubits championed by companies like IBM and Rigetti? Is it, is it trapped ions championed by a company like IonQ? Is it photonics, a completely optical? Is it say uh, neutral atoms, which is say a, a company like Pascal in, in uh, France is looking at? The, these, are, these are different modalities and they're vastly different. It's not like looking at, well, he's got a CMOS chip and I've got a bipolar chip here in, in silicon. These are vastly different technologies. They use vastly different physical phenomena to implement the quantum qubits. And, and there's not a lot of overlap between the technology and the jury is really still out on which particular one has the best chance of emerging as the favorite or if a favorite will eventually emerge that we haven't talked about, or the third case is, will we ultimately have machines that have different quantum modalities for different operations or even different algorithms? Maybe superconducting qubits will lend themselves more effectively to optimization, where if you're looking at, say, machine learning, maybe that's something that the optical world can, can deal with more effectively. No one really knows just yet. And because of that uncertainty, no one can sit down and come up with a predictable roadmap 
for exactly how advances in quantum computing writ large will take place. Companies give you roadmaps based on some of their best estimates, but some of the underlying technology is still prob problematic. It's still in the scientific discovery realm. It's not engineering. Don't think of this as Intel, TikTok. We're gonna give you a new processor every two years with clock speeds that do this and another processor every two years with algorithm changes that do this. It's, we haven't reached that, that part yet. This really speaks in some sense to uh, looming workforce issues. Uh, the, the sector has taken off uh, and yet the number of, of, of quantum experts, of people who are gear, who are really um, schooled and familiar with a lot of the nuts and bolts in quantum development is limited and they're, they're, they're a well sought after resource. So the workforce issues here are looming, but there's some solutions on the horizon. I'll get to those a little later. The bottom line to all this is that treating quantum computing as a stable market in the same way that I glibly refer to, say, uh, GPUs or other advanced computing accelerators, uh, that hasn't happened yet. And so making a business case to look at quantum computing as a fundamental business. People have called me up and said, we're really working on a, we want to come up with a return on investment uh, estimate for bringing quantum into our company. And I say, it's too early. You can't do that. There's no way to really quantify some of this stuff yet. And, to, and, and so you need to think about this more as a not a leap of faith, but at least a, perhaps a more speculative technology than the ones you're used to working with. Uh, so let me, just, let me just move on here. I wanna give a, a couple of, of, of slides that just give you a sense of some of the quantum research activities from 50,000 meters. And the key here, uh, the key takeaway, if you will, is that uh, when I talk to clients in the US, they tend to have US centric uh, perspectives on quantum computing. And, and, and part of that is, is I, I, I'll call it narrow mindedness perhaps, but part of it is also because the, the IT sector writ large has been around for many years and it's been dominated by a few significant players, primarily those in the US with a certain amount of, uh, you know, I won't call them second tier players, but folks who didn't stand head and shoulders with US. I talk about a lot of European companies, what say went on in Japan and some other locations. But the bottom line here is that quantum is a clean slate technology. There's no legacy advantage here. There's no real advantage towards having been involved in classical computing to any great extent. This is a green field technology, which means that from a global perspective, you need to think about this as a global phenomena. It's not just an extension of existing IT leadership. And so what these two charts really show is all I did is I went into a uh, Scopus, which is an R&D database that collects research papers from um, a wide range of respectable technical scientific journals, engineering journals, conference proceedings and such, and just did some simple searches. The chart on the left, I just, I just basically grabbed the easiest way I could look at for quantum computing uh, search terms. I conducted the search on May 21st, and I got a, a total of about 15,000 documents. And this is really the chart on the left, as I said, kind of gives you a sense that there's probably three takeaways here that I think are interesting. The first one is the United States and China are clearly producing some of the most uh, the most research papers in, in quantum computing, uh, but you simply cannot deny the fact that this is a global phenomenon. You see Germany, UK, India, Japan, and this list, this tail goes down very deeply. And that's, uh, this is something that is, is clearly a global phenomenon. The other takeaway is if you look at the general trends of all these companies, they're all positive uh, from between 2015 to 2019. And I can tell you if I uh, update this to 2020 and 2021, these numbers continue to curve up uh, so the interest here is not only international, but it is it is growing at the same time. Just for uh, sake of um, comparison, just because people do talk about quantum computing, uh, excuse me, quantum communications, I just give you a sense of, of what's going on in that field. Note the change of scale, though. Uh, there is less activities in quantum communications. But what's interesting here is that China is really leading the pack globally in terms of quantum communications and and I can tell you that's really driven by the fact that China is very interested in secure communications, the phenomena within quantum com communications that allows you to send a signal and know if it has been compromised in transit. If you send a signal down a wire in the classical world, you can't tell if someone has intercepted it, read it, and then reproduced it, or intercepted, read it, and then introduced error into your signal. In the quantum world, that is fundamentally impossible to do. So the issue of secure communications in quantum is one that's very compelling. 
It's something that certain nations are looking at primarily for national security applications and such, but also for financial and business and, and some of the more proprietary information that may go through the commercial sector. But it is something to look at as well. Again, a global phenomenon, China clearly in the leader, leadership position, but, but a wide range of other country, countries looking at that as well. And, and really what this is built on now, remember I said earlier, this is not a business case world uh, right now. Uh, so a lot of the quantum research that's going on there right now is driven by national or regional government quantum programs. And here's just really a sampling of what's going on in terms of some of the major countries that we're keeping track of. And I will tell you, A, this is not an exhaustive list of nations uh, who are doing the work. And, and B, this is not the only program that's going on within each of these regions. I just picked a few leadership ones. So don't, don't think that this is all that if, if you go look at what's going on in Japan and you, you look at the QLE program, you've covered the field. There are many, many programs from a technology perspective, from an ecosystem perspective, not only doing R&D, but, but thinking about building quantum system suppliers for the commercial sector, and perhaps most importantly, for developing end user applications, for thinking about government programs that try to drive quantum technology from an economic perspective. Can we bring in automakers? Can we bring in aircraft manufacturers, machine tool makers, or other organizations that could use the quantum technology? So it's not just about driving quantum push to develop technology. It's driving quantum technology pull to drive it into the commercial sector or to drive it into use cases, either for economic gains or for national security agenda. And that's really one of the overriding um, success metrics in my perspective of some of these programs that they think about the push and pull aspects of quantum tech. So that was just, a, that was just from the government perspective. Let me give you a quick snapshot of what's going on in the commercial sector right now. There clearly is a, glow, a growing collection of quantum computing hardware suppliers. It's a wide and diverse range of suppliers. They're um, not only limited to the US, the US has probably some of the, the larger and more visible ones, but there's a lot of work going on around the world. They're what I call legacy players, companies that have been in, in the IT sector for an awful long time and have committed to quantum as, as part of their overall supply chain. A company like IBM looks at quantum uh, as part of their overall service package, even though recently they've concentrated much more on quantum as a product than they have looking at their traditional high-end product lines. Then you have what I call the integrated player, and Honeywell is a wonderful example. Um, I saw Honeywell just came out with a uh, basically a, a, a trapped ion uh, development program they've been working on for over a decade, and they finally they finally emerged from stealth, uh, uh, I guess, a little time uh, late last year. And what was interesting, Honeywell is an integrated player because they make things like avionics and electronics and, and, and advanced machine tools and such. And, and a quote from the, the director of, of the, the Honeywell quantum program was, we expect Honeywell to be one of our largest customers. Uh, so it's interesting that they're actually building this almost to supply their, their in-house demand uh, as a first order customer, which I think is a, an interesting business model. Nice to always have the, uh, a guaranteed customer. Then there's a number of new entrants out there, and I call these the pure play guys. These are guys that didn't exist until quantum came along, and they exist exclusively for quantum. And, and some of the favorites are not just, this is just a smattering of suggestions. IonQ, as I said, that's a focused uh, trapped ion company. Rigetti, superconducting qubits called Quanta, Quantum Circuit, Sanadu, IQM. There's a, there's a whole range of companies out there. Intel, as a component supplier, is also looking at quantum development and their particular bent is trying to think about how they can use their expertise in silicon manufacturing and process control and understanding how to build integrated systems uh, to, to bring that skill set to what's going on in the quantum world. Oddly enough, we have what I call the non-traditional players, Alibaba, AWS, Baidu, Google, and Microsoft. And if you've looked at that list, you figured out, wait a minute, those are all uh, cloud service providers. What are they doing here as well? Well, the, the, certainly the cloud service providers have a couple things going for them. The one thing right now is they have pretty deep pockets when it comes to R&D. Certainly AWS and Google and Microsoft all have an interest, have R&D budgets that in some sense can eclipse what's going on in the traditional IT world when it comes to speculative technology. The other thing is cloud service providers are really, really interested in coming up with product differentiators. The ability to offer a service or a capability that would keep you from migrating from Google to AWS to Microsoft uh, or, or Baidu or, or Alibaba. And so they are working hard on new technologies that they can bring to their cloud service providing environment.
that can differentiate them from the other CSPs. The other thing is there are myriad stealth players out there. There are a lot of small companies, a lot of startups that are looking at a lot of new and interesting technologies. The preponderance of them are within the software realm. And a lot of them are very small. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by small and, and stealthy when we get to some other numbers. But you simply cannot take the fact that this is a sector that is rife with startups. The venture capital sector, primarily in the US, has become very interested in funding a lot of work on this. And if you're, if you're interested in funding a small startup in the quantum field, looking at a, a smart, uh, company that may have one or two professors who came out of university, brought some postdocs with them, and has some interesting ideas for a quantum algorithm or a way to convert a, a quantum application, say for a specific vertical like oil and gas reservoir extraction optimization programs, you can get funding nowadays. Um, so there's there's a lot of dynamics there. Um, let me see. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so I just I just quickly touched on. Wait a minute. Google, Google, Microsoft, and AWS. These guys have a wide range of quantum computing uh, activities going on here. Amazon has their own their, their basically this this, this bracket uh, phenomena where they're cloud service providers for Rigetti, Iron Q, and D Wave. So if you want to kick the tires on some of these existing quantum computing systems, you can go through Amazon and do it basically the same way you would opening up an instance if you wanted to get you know, a, a two CPU, four GPU instance with eight gigabyte of memory uh, running, uh, you know, CentOS. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, available for just basically logging in and, and kicking the tires on. Uh, Amazon has a solutions lab where they're looking at quantum computing application development. And they've also stood up a center for quantum computing uh, with Caltech and a number of universities to do legitimate quantum computing hardware R&D. Google right now has a fascinating uh, quantum processor called Sycamore. It's a 53 cub qubit system. Uh, they're also looking at a TensorFlow uh, optimization for hybrid classical quantum AI algorithms. A lot of good research there. The interesting thing about Google, and uh, I don't know if there's anyone on the line here from Google, but they have probably one of the most enthusiastic public relations departments when it comes to what Google is up to. Uh, they tend to make a lot of announcements. Uh, a lot of those announcements confuse the hell out of people. I know because I get questions every time someone says, Google says they just declared quantum supremacy again. What does this mean? Um, it's part of the confusion within the sector. Um, I, sometimes I wish, I wish Google would just kick back every now and then uh, when it came to announcing progress there. Uh, Microsoft has a wide range of, of, of opportunities as well. They are cloud service provider for Honeywell, IonQ, quantum circuits. Um, they're, they're looking at starting up a quantum network, which means they would be a broker to match up quantum computing hardware suppliers with potential quantum computing application developers and software developers. They have a, a quantum uh, software development kit. Uh, and they also have a very, very esoteric topological qubit development activity. I didn't mention topological qubits. Uh, theoretically, they're one of the most interesting quantum modalities out there, most promising in terms of um, all of the, the factors that would lead you to believe this would be the winner when it comes to making quantum computers. The problem is they are hellaciously hard to build and no one has actually yet demonstrated the successful development of a topological qubit system. Uh, so good theoretically, very tough physically. Uh, so the jury's still out there, but Microsoft is pursuing it with a certain degree of enthusiasm. Now I put this chart up here to talk about the range of quantum software developers out there. I talked about how many different startups there were and such. And this list is by no means complete. And the only way it could be up to date is if it was updated in, in literally real time. But the reason I put this chart up here is, is if you go across the top, if you look at D-Wave, Google, IBM, Microsoft, and Rigetti, those are basically the, the, the if you will, the, the standards of, of, of quantum computing hardware. Those are kind of your application programmer interfaces. That's the part of the ecosystem that lives between applications program development and the actual hardware base. And what you see is that the quantum computing ecosystem has matured to the point where even if I'm a small software company, I don't have to pick a particular hardware modality or company to, to bet my entire future on. So if I'm a company like say, Cambridge Quantum Computing, my software is, is usable on different kinds of systems. I, you can run it on IBM, you can run it through Google, uh, the, certain systems you can run on, on IBM or, or even D-Wave, which is a, an alternate scheme for building quantum computers called uh, uh, linear annealing. We won't get into that. But the bottom line of this chart is 
the sector has matured enough to the point where there's a certain amount of separation. So software vendors don't have to buy into or commit all their resources to a specific kind of quantum hardware. And that's in some sense, one of the mitigating factors when it comes to workforce development, which means that software developers in the quantum space don't have to be quantum physicists. They don't have to really get too involved in the underlying physics to write good quantum algorithms. If you go to a number of these smaller companies or any company that's developing quantum software, increasingly they're not requiring deep degrees or deep education or experience in quantum computing as much as they are sophisticated software development, software engineers and such who know how to write code, who know how to take advantage of a, of a, of a smart software developer kit. And, and really that's what we're seeing in, in, in the world right now is this idea that the workforce can be dealt with because we're starting to see that, that software hardware ecosystem in quanting, quantum become a little more solidified so I can pick a slice and say, I don't need to know what's, what's abstractions above me. I don't need to know what impl implementations below me. I just need to know where I fit into the ecosystem. I can hire people, I can train people, and I can live in that particular slice without having to get too involved. The, the counterpart I always like to say is, I guarantee there's very few Python programmers out there who can tell you exactly the physics behind a CMOS gate. They don't need to know that. And much the same way that within hopefully the next few years, a quantum application developer won't really have to know the specifics about what's going on in the particular IBM Q system that they're running. I just wanted to just, just a quick call out right now. Again, I, I want to make sure that I, I follow my own advice and, and, and point out that this is a global phenomena. EO participation is high. There's a, there's a pretty vibrant uh, quantum computing startup landscape over there. Lots of interesting government programs. The French, I guess a couple of weeks ago, literally just announced that they were more than tripling their annual contribution, the French government, the contribution to quantum computing research. I think they're going to, um, gosh, I want to say they went from 500 to a couple billion dollars a year in funding. Very aggressive, puts them close to Germany, still behind national level funding in the United States and China, but very aggressive. And as I mentioned earlier, very interested in developing the technology the, the, the quantum computing supplier ecosystem, as well as making sure that the industrial sector can absorb that technology. Uh, I just wanted to quickly touch base on Japan, um, just because they are, this is, there's, there's many ways you can attack the quantum computing issue, even if you're not a quantum computing supplier. And these are three of the largest, biggest Japanese companies, largest Japanese companies out there. And they've all taken a different route. Uh, to get to quantum. NEC, which is a large vendor of high performance computers, um, they basically just came up with a joint venture where they're looking at taking their big systems, partnering with a company called D-Wave, which I mentioned earlier, the, the, the linear annealer uh, uh, quantum computing company, and thinking about hybrid applications. Can we build systems that use quantum computing for the, the, the particulars that quantum computing does well, and but iterate between the quantum computing system and a classic supercomputer to meet an existing application in the highest level of performance. Uh, so D-Wave and NEC are exploring that, each company bringing to bear its, its particular skills in classical or quantum, um, but that's not the only company doing that. This is just my marker to remind myself to mention that hybrid systems right now, the, the issue of the, the, the confluence of HPCs and quantum computers in a hybrid environment are probably one of the most interesting areas of quantum computing research today. It's not as if, and I think I said, I don't know if I said this earlier, don't think about quantum as this, this technology that's an island that sits off different from the classical world that stands apart. Quantum is part of the overall advanced computing environment and it's being drawn that way by lots and lots of interest in this hybrid classical quantum research um, uh, agenda. And we're seeing it within a lot of companies. We're seeing it at the national government level. Oak Ridge, uh, one of the DOE labs, Office of Science I mentioned earlier, has a very interesting program right now looking at, at, at hybrid quantum classical algorithms using supercomputers, high performance computers as part of the process. It's literally a system where you think about a single program where you iterate back and forth between the two worlds Classical doing what it does best, high performance, high precision, high reliability, high re reproducibility, and the quantum side, which gives you the simultaneous exploration of, of multiple scenarios at the same time, 
taking advantage of each to optimize the performance of a single output. So she was looking at the same kinds of things. Uh, they, they have a, basically a digital implementation of a quantum computer as well as Fujitsu. The idea that you can take the phenomena of quantum computing and implement it in a digital simulator, it offers you a certain amount of quantum capability for research, verification, and validation, but at the same time, you don't have to deal with the, um, the histogram, if you will, of, of probabilities of outcomes. So it gives you a controlled environment to do research. And a lot of folks are interested in using that, as I said, to basically help verify algorithm and, algorithm and application and theoretical quantum programming uh, processes. So I'm going to get quickly into uh, some efforts that we, we took recently to think about the, how we could talk about quantum, the quantum computing market. As I said earlier, re return on investment and some of the other stuff is difficult. You know, the bottom line here is that most of what's going on in quantum computing right now from the corporate side is dependent on the largest of government programs, commercial venturing, and venture capital. It's still a market that's driven primarily by future potential than it is in terms of, a, of, a, of an ongoing virtuous cycle of technology drives products, which drives revenues, which drives research, which drives technology, and so on. So thinking about a market potential here as a way to try to bring the grown-ups into the room to inject some stability and some predictability into the market rich large, writ large became an interesting exercise uh, for a number of folks within the quantum computing world. And ultimately, last year, um, Hyperion Research was, was asked by an organization called the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which is a, uh, basically a government-funded private sector consortium funded out of the National Quantum Initiative to basically help development of U.S. quantum technology ecosystem competitiveness and, 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 and all the other great buzzwords. And they asked us if we could do a study to look at uh, potentially coming up with a, a potential market projection. And my first thought was, hell no, uh, that's, it's, it's too mature, it's too early. This is not really something that, that we can do with a great degree of confidence, but we, we, we figured we'd take a shot at it anyway. But what we did was we went out and we talked to 135 different quantum computing suppliers out there. And I use the phrase supplier here very liberally in terms of a supplier could be a, a university that's looking at that supplies quantum insights, quantum algorithms, quantum research. It could be a government lab that's doing research for some end use application for the Department of Energy, or it could be a commercial vendor that's looking to, to come up with a product. And so we talked about 135 of them. Because this was a QEDC funded activity, we concentrated primarily in the US, but we did manage to cover, you see on the right there, we did manage to get a reasonable amount of, of variety across academic, commercial, and government sector. And I, I won't go into all the details of, of how we came up with some of these numbers. Maybe I will a little bit. But the bottom line was, what we came up with was these kinds of estimates. Um, we basically, this first number here, the global quantum computing market was worth about $250 million in 2019. This was, quite frankly, a simple calculation where those 135 organizations we talked to, the percentage that was commercial, we asked them what their revenues were. We basically said, how much money did you make last year? selling quantum computing equipment and such. And then we had to pull out our little uh, pack of assumptions. And we had to say things like, what percentage of the US quantum computing suppliers participated in our survey? And what percentage of the global supply of quantum computing technology is US? And if you, if, if you look at the, the work we came up with, we made some basic assumptions about those sizes. We tried to backfill with some analysis and such. And we came up with the $250 million. Now, when we wanted to think about how the market would grow, we definitely didn't want to talk to the vendors. We didn't want to say, what are your market projections for the next three to four years? Because we just figured we couldn't really trust those numbers. Um, because what we were collecting would be collecting 135 different market projections and the average of that doesn't really yield too much. So what we did is we came up with a second companion study, which I'll give some details in a minute. And we talked to, I think 115 different current end users or potential end users of quantum computing technology. Potential meaning they're thinking about dipping their toe in within say the next three years. And we asked them what their quantum computing budget was or would be if they were involved and what that budget would grow to in say the next few years. And so we, we collected from the supplier, from the uh, consumer base, their expectations for budget growth 
And we combined, and basically when we looked at those particular budget numbers, we came up with a compound aggregate growth rate of about 27% per year. And that was from the poll side of the technology. So basically now that we had position and velocity, we were able to really say, okay, start out with 250 million in 2019, give us a CAGR of 27% because that's the projected growth rate from the, the end user perspective. And that gives us kind of a market projection. We also asked some other questions within this survey. We asked them about um, the algorithm space. And, and it turns out that the algorithm space within quantum from, from both the supplier and user base breaks out relatively evenly between optimization, physical simulation, and machine learning. Uh, we asked them a little, a little bit about how they were gonna access their hardware. Cloud access models seem to be the prevalent way to go. If you look at the, the hardware, the, the market, um, on-prem and cloud access, hardware sales will comprise about 50% of the global market. A whole bunch of different things that came out of that survey. And so this is, you know, when you, when you do studies like this for, for grownups, you have to come up with charts like this. And so this was the market projection, as I said earlier, we grew from say 320 million in 2020 to 830 by 2024. And this is kind of a breakdown that, that, that shows how the, the, the suppliers envision the market breaking out between hardware, uh, hardware to the cloud, professional services, uh, middleware and applications and others, and then, and then chunked in the, um, the CAGR growth rates from the other study of users. And so this was, this was the chart that we used to kind of project in terms of a market projection. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of other charts. This is a little backfill, if you will, about that buyer user study that I talked about. Um, 38 academics, 61 commercial, and um, a bunch of government. Key here, which I was real happy about, was we were able to reach out to a lot more uh, organizations outside the United States. We hit Europe pretty hard. I would have liked to see more in China, Asia Pacific and such. But you know, the chart on the right shows that we at least talk to the right people in terms of end users. Who are the folks, when we ask this question about what's going on within QC, within your end use organization, we, we really hit the right people. Very early on in this talk, if you remember back, I talked about the potential gap between what's going on in terms of what people want um, from an end use perspective versus what the quantum computing supplier narrative is. And this is one of the charts that I think really drives home some of the differences. When we ask the buyer users, how do you envision quantum computing augmenting your overall workload in the near future? And here we gave them a bunch of choices, but the key was they could pick multiple responses. So we didn't say you had to pick one, they said where you see it. And you'll see that, you know, there's certainly, you know, the, 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 the favorite choice was enable new applications, not previously possible on classical systems. Almost two thirds listed that as, as um, you know, what, what their vision is. But 59%, almost the same amount, said just speed up existing applications on hybrid classical quantum systems or speed up existing or new applications with quantum inspired algorithms on classical systems. This is another aspect of this, is that new algorithmic research in quantum computing has led to some breakthroughs in implementing those algorithms on classical architectures. They said, fine, let's, I'll, I'll do that too. Uh, develop new quantum computing applications. There's two points to take away from this. The first one is there's a broad range of expectations here that people are open to bringing quantum computing in to serve a number of different potential use cases. And what was interesting is only 14 respondents chose a single performance option and a whole bunch chose three or more. That tells me two things. They're very open or they haven't really decided what quantum can offer them just yet. So they're willing to check all the boxes. Um, I'd like to think it's probably a little bit of both. But the idea here is that the users are very, very open to a number of different options. It's not all about new quantum algorithms that were previously unavailable on your classical system. It's more than just that. So then we really drilled down and we said, okay, what minimum application performance gain would you require to justify using quantum computing for your existing and planned workloads? And this is where I think this gap really came to the fore. Now remember I talked about, if you, if you look at quantum computing uh, press releases and, and some of the back and forth, you'll see that quantum superiority, quantum advantage, intractable on classical systems is what the, the sector's trying to drive and what they're competing towards. If you ask the end users, uh, basically 42% of the, of the end users we spoke to said, if you can give us 50X performance improvements or below, we're in. And only 20% would lead, need less than 10X. Um, that's, 
that is a relatively conservative performance requirement based on what you would think from listening to what the quantum computing supplier base talks about. And to put that in terms that uh, the classical world understands, that 50x performance that would satisfy 42% of the people we spoke to, um, that's about a four to five year jump in performance in the classical computing world. Which means that if, if I want 50x performance on an application, I can usually expect to wait about four to five years till the machine I can buy commercially is gonna give me that performance gain. Uh, that tells me that quantum computing is viewed more as a competitive advantage. I can get a 50x performance boost over my non-quantum computing competitor. That's more important than new applications, intractable quantum superiority applications or such. This really tells me that from an end user perspective, this is more about end use performance gains than it is demonstrating the, the value of quantum compared to classical computers writ large. Uh, there was an article in the Post a couple of days ago that really kind of jarred me. The bottom line, it, it, was, it was talking about how you frame issues and such. And the example they used was a company called Monsanto, which developed GMO seeds uh, early on and, and the entire marketing campaign was geared towards selling GMO enhanced seeds to the farmers to convince them of all the benefits. And what happened was Monsanto forgot that their customer is not farmers, it's consumers who eat the food that those seeds eventually turn into. And that's why there was a huge hue and cry about GMO free kinds of um, you know, protests and boycotts and, and, and consternation and such, because in some sense, Monsanto forgot who their customer was. They didn't realize that people are gonna end, end up eating the food and they should have thought more sophisticated about how you position a GMO product and who your customer really is. And sometimes I think the quantum computing sector somehow doesn't understand that their customers are end users. This is not a competition between quantum computing developers as much as it is trying to match what the customer's expectations are. And to me, that's a key takeaway from some of the, some of the work we've been doing. This is just a little background here on uh, how we came to that 27% CAGR. Uh, and the, the thing that it, 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 I've, I've tried to grapple with this chart to make it look a little more clear, but let me just see if I can explain it rather quickly. If you look at the, the graphic on the left, if you look at the bucket that says none or very little, you'll see three bars. The tall bar on the left was how much were you spending in 2019 on quantum computing in your company? And you'll see that 37 out of the 115 companies we talked to said none or very little. Well, if you go to 2022, you see the number drops to 15. And if you go to 2024, you see the number drops to three. So that means of the 115 companies we talked to, only three said in 2024, they'll be spending none or little. That, that speaks well for expectations in terms of quantum computing uptake in the, in the, in the, by end users. Look at the opposite of that going the other way, say the 25 to $50 million bucket there. Uh, granted, there were only four companies that said 20 to 25 million in 2019, but that number grows to over 12 in, uh, by 2024. So not only is the number of companies not involved in quantum going down, the companies that are involved are spending more and more as, as time progresses. And this is where we came up with our 27% our CAGR because we just did some hand-waving in terms of what this means to the overall market size and what this means in terms of spend budget. This doesn't predict how much money will appear in the quantum computing um, sector. It indicates how much money will be spent. So for example, if I'm, if I'm a large end user in the HPC world, I may spend X dollars to buy HPC hardware and software, but I may be spending three or four X in-house to support that with in-house programmers, subject matter experts, all the other budgetary concerns that go into that that don't get realized by the actual vendors. And so that's why we see these numbers that are bigger than the market, but they're well within the range of how much these companies are going to be spending, not only on the outside world, but inside but it still led us to believe that that 27% CAGR was a reasonable estimate. Um, so this is how all this plays out near term is, you know, the bottom line here is that there's many exploring applications and use cases and not just traditional HPC. We've seen a lot of interest in the enterprise computing environment in sectors that would never consider themselves HPC users, wouldn't be going to the supercomputer shows, uh, you know, around the world and such, but, but would look at quantum and say, hey, this may give us an interesting 
economic or competitive advantage for a specific use case we have. And we're starting to see more and more interest in that within the enterprise IT world. So in the early days, we were, we were figuring out we could just scope quantum as it would fit into the advanced computing realm, the technical computing, that $24 billion market I talked about earlier. But I think there's gonna be some significant uptake in with the enterprise IT world as well in conjunction with what's going on in, in the HPC world. Um, the concern that the issue here in terms of the next big milestone from the, the 50,000 foot perspective is the QC subject matter expert application developer, developer. The guy who can sit down, who could walk into an oil and gas company and talk about optimization of oil reservoir, uh, oil reservoir extraction processes uh, and turn that into a quantum application is going to be golden. Uh, the folks who can who can clearly talk about applications development within a particular vertical in a way that that can be brought to bear on a quantum computing algorithm or application process are going to be the next really interesting folks to look for. And those are the ones who are going to garner the biggest salaries and the ones who are going to really help the sector take off. And any infrastructure in terms of software development kits or any other uh, commercially available professional services or, or middleware or application uh, packages that help facilitate that process are going to be ones that are be critical to the growth of the sector. Uh, I think we've demonstrated uh, without a doubt from both the supplier and end user base that the market will be growing at least for the next few years. And that should give a sigh of relief to all the investors out there, to the government programs, uh, to the venture capital and corporate uh, venture groups who are, who are putting money into this. The big talk a few years ago, I haven't heard much in the last year or so, was for those of us who are older enough to remember uh, AI winter in the late 80s, where there was a ton of funding and a ton of promises in what AI could bring that ultimately didn't show up on delivery on schedule. And it, and, and, and it basically froze out funding for AI. And we, we called it AI winter because it took an awful long time for the sector to recover uh, from that AI winter. Uh, and, and there was always the specter, are we going to get a quantum winter? Are we overselling? Are we overfunded for, for the kind of work that we're, we're promising? Are we meeting the right timescales? That's always hanging back in people's minds. We did a survey last year, and we asked a number of quantum computing makers in the United States, what do you think the odds are of a quantum winter coming? And I defined unilaterally and arbitrarily a quantum winter as a at least a 25% decrease in R&D funding that lasts three years or more within the next decade. And 50% of the companies we talked to said, we think that will happen. Oddly enough, only 25% of the buyers and users thought that. Uh, so they're much more optimistic about the future. Whether they're more optimistic or they don't understand the practical realities of the sector, um, I don't know. But the bottom line is these companies are all operating with this, this, this sort of Damocles over their heads in some sense in terms of we cannot overpromise, we cannot glibly assume that funding will always be there for all of us. I talked to one executive that said, I'm not even going to make a prediction. I operate entirely on the premise that there will be a quantum winter, and we need to winterize our product lines, we win to winterize our R&D programs and our funding. So keep that in the back of your mind. I don't know if the specter's there, but at least for the next few years, I'm confident that there will be continued funding. Uh, the key here, quantum computing is not a replacement for classical computing. It's not an island unto itself. It is a companion technology. It is another option to continue pushing forward advanced computing capabilities. Um, it is at, at some level, if you squint hard enough, it's the next generation. It's, it's, it's what follows GPUs. It's a quantum accelerator. It, it, it's basically a way to attack a, a, a class of applications with an interesting performance enhancer uh, for certain use, use cases. It's not a panacea. It's not the end all be all. It's, it's, it's part of the overall advanced computing portfolio, if you will. Uh, please be reminded the sector, sector is not at Moore's law stage. I used to have a chart that was um, talked about progress. And you know the x-axis was time, uh, and, and the y-axis was some level of performance metrics. But the bottom line was I made a huge case to say that the x-axis was 100% nonlinear, that one little bit of it could be 10 years, and a large part of it could be 10 seconds. It, it's going to move in fits and starts. It's going to be unpredictable. No one knows exactly how the technology is going to move forward. There could be a significant breakthrough. We could get to an engineering stage for some modalities. IBM is very 
um, cognizant of the fact that they want to be able to roll out and demonstrate stable progress on their superconducting qubit capability. But there are other organizations that are much that are interested more in terms of just just you know gunning and running to to to, to implement breakthrough technology on an unpredictable basis. We're not there yet. And development is happening in many directions. I talked about the variety of hardware, talked about the variety of all the software and applications and use cases out there, hybrid classical systems, quantum inspired uh, hardware and software out there as well. So bottom line is there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff going on out there, lots of variability, lots of unpredictability. But like they say at the beginning of every state of the union, you know, the state of quantum computing, at least for this year, is safe and stable and will be for the next few years, but it's just gonna be a really fun sector to watch uh, going forward. So that, I think, yes, that was the last thing I had. So let's, let me see if I can run through some of the questions here, um, if there's any. And if you, if you have any other questions, I didn't, actually there's not terribly many questions, so maybe I wasn't controversial enough or not interesting enough. But if you have any questions, you know, please, please submit them. I'll try to get them, um, I'll get them going. Uh, let's see, nice to meet you. What are the growing areas for quantum consulting services? Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the professional services at this particular point in time. I think that, you know, as I said, there are a lot of users, uh, certainly in the enterprise IT space that, that don't have a lot of uh, um, history in advanced computing. Um, and, and they're looking for some guidance. To me, the beauty of quantum computing right now, unlike other opportunities for classical advanced computing, in the old days, if you wanted to get into advanced computing and you wanted to go out and buy a Cray, you had to drop $40 million, you had to spend a lot of money reconverting your basement to have huge power capabilities, cooling capabilities. You had to buy the big box, you had to buy a programming staff, a systems operations staff, and it cost you a whole lot of money to do all that. And that was before you first that was before you ran your first piece of code. In quantum computing, you can dip your toe in it with a cloud access model and a couple of PhDs, physicists, or even some smart programmers and start to think about looking at quantum computing and how it can fit within your company. The barriers to entry to explore quantum computing from an end user perspective are, are myriad. Uh, you saw all the cloud service provider options. You saw all the different companies are out there. The barriers to entry, the costs are incredibly low, and all you really need to do is, 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 is either grow some in-house capability. I know of one company that hired a PhD geophysicist, um, smart guy, and they said, um, one day a week, you keep track of what's going on in the quantum sector, and you tell us if and when we need to get involved in a, in a, in a more enthusiastic way. So there's a lot of companies interested in trying to figure out what's going on there, and the idea of um, professional services to help guide people to make some of the right choices and ultimately to separate an awful lot of the wheat from the chaff. Um, I mentioned earlier how Google tends to, or they, they haven't as much as they used to, produce lots and lots of interesting results that, that confuse people. Uh, IBM and some other companies have come up with something called the quantum volume metric to, to basically um, demonstrate their performance improvements. They, they come up, they, this definition of quantum volume is a collection of a number of different performance parameters. Um, every time IBM or Honeywell is another one that, that, that talks about quantum volume, comes out with a new quantum volume number, I get a lot of emails saying, is this it? Is this important? What do I need to know? Um, again, it's, it's not knowing who you're selling to perhaps at some level. Users are, you know, don't understand a lot of these breakthroughs. They don't understand you know, how this is important to their particular workloads, to their particular use cases. And the idea of people who can really kind of separate the wheat from the chaff and bring some of the technology advances into, a, into the realm of understandable from end users perspective, I think are the folks who are gonna do really, really well uh, within the sector. Um, someone asked about, can QC practically solve large linear systems commonly found in many mod sim or inversion applications? Can HHL algorithms outperform classical algorithms in practice? That's a really good question. And my, my particular mindset on all this, and I know this is the case with HHL. And the, the idea here is, you know, ultimately one of the things that, you know, mod sim 
calculations really want is, you know, you've got to, uh, fundamentally, you're talking about a bunch of simultaneous equations. I have 10,024 equations with 10,024 variables, and I want to solve that to get my, the, the solution of the variables. And I'll use something, you know, Gaussian elimination or something. And, and those are, that's a, a kind of a classical algorithm for solving, you know, those kinds of, of problems, very common in, in mod sim. And HHL is kind of the quantum counterpart to that. The problem with all of quantum systems, and, and you know, I alluded to it a little bit earlier in my simple little quantum goodness graphic, is input-output. Um, you can only put so much data in in the classical mode and process it, and only so much data can come out, because ultimately all of your quantum goodness has to collapse into that binary output. So in some sense, most algorithms, and I know HHL is one of them, is, is really constrained more about performance limitations of the data I.O. than it is in terms of what goes on within the quantum process itself. So when you have an HHL algorithm, you don't actually get out the answer, what were the 10,024 variable values you were trying to ascertain. You get out something that leads you to help figure out what those values could be. And it's because of this IO issue that regardless of the sophistication of the calculations in the quantum realm, it always has to collapse to a number of binary I ones and zeros. And this really is kind of the mindset I use for a quantum system, where if I think about a classical uh, calculation in the mod sim world, I have some initial conditions and some relatively simple um, governing equations. Think about an n-body simulation. I have a couple of data on say nine planets and um, some initial conditions that I have the government equations for gravitation. And I could run that simulation all day and come up with some interesting answers. The key there is small data in, small data out um, kinds of stuff. Um, big data on the other hand, tons and tons of big data goes in and ultimately your answer may come out to be either do this or don't do this. Big data in, lots of calculations, but um, basically lots of little calculations on lots of data, not a lot of connection between them and a simple answer out. Quantum is really more about simple data in, complex interactions in the quantum realm, and then simple data out. And, and that's really the best way to think about quantum is right now, more than anything else, it is IO limited because you're moving from the quantum realm, you're moving from the logical, the classical world to the quantum realm back to the logical classical world. And that gives you this, this constraint. So a lot of these interesting applications just simply aren't amenable to, to quantum calculation because you can't get sophisticated data out. So in the classical world, you could do this n-body simulation and you could have a, a video that runs, this is what the planets are gonna look like for the next million years. Uh, and, and you may have terabytes of data to display that. In the quantum world, you're looking at fundamentally ones and zeros at some level. You've lost all the sophistication that was existing during the quantum calculation when you come back into the, into the classical world. And that's a fundamental constraint. So when you look at any particular algorithm, whether it be HHL or, or any of the machine learning or any of the optimization stuff, you're really looking at applications that have relatively low requirements for IO, but very, very complex interactions. That's why things like molecular modeling, calculating the lowest energy states of a, of a molecule um, is, works really well. Your, your initial input's very uh, simple. All the complex interactions that, that quantify, that, that basically quantify the quantum interactions of those molecules take place in the quantum world, and then you get some energy state uh, numbers coming out at the other end. So that's really uh, kind of the, the way I think about this stuff. Um, Someone asked about a training advice request, a small firm. Uh, they have some C and Python programmers, hopefully not in the same room. Uh, where would you consider placing initial effort, able to allocate three full-time equivalents for three to four months? I, I really like uh, IBM's uh, Kids Kit, their quantum experience for an introductory uh, kind of uh, thing I've done. I've, I've programmed on, on their, their systems. I, I, I found them easy to use. Um, that's a, that's a really good place to start. I would D-Wave has some interesting capabilities as well, um, but I, I would and 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 certainly Forrest uh, Rigetti has some stuff. What I would do is not limit yourself. I would think about you know um, maybe doing a, a quick survey for the first week to just to see what some of the different uh, potentials are, which ones you like, which ones you don't like. 
uh, that kind of stuff to really get people to start thinking about the systems. You know, this way you're not wedded to a specific implementation and you can start to see which ones offer different value and which ones offer the kinds of features that may be more amenable to, to you know, your mindset or your workloads or things like that. Uh, as I said earlier, the field is wide open. So moving back and forth between these things uh, at the programmer level is not all that hard. Um, you know, there's lots of programs out there on Jupyter Notebooks that show you how to actually write code for a lot of these different these different organizations. And so I would think right now more in terms of flexibility uh, and transportability than locking in and saying, OK, I'm going to go with, you know, um, whatever Microsoft's program is, Q Sharp, those kinds of things and, and think about um, flexibility more than anything else. Uh, someone asked, tell us more about software that replaced oil industry software, and where do I start looking into research into this whole field? Name of sources, please. Um, I'm not an oil industry expert here, um, so I, I'm going to have to pass on that particular one. If you send me an email, uh, maybe I can, I can do some digging, but I'm not going to be able to talk about that off, my off the top of my head. I will tell you, one of the things that I find interesting about the oil sector um, and, and this is from experience with, uh, we have one particular large oil company um, as a client, and maybe this will give you some insight as to how the oil companies writ large think about advanced computing. Uh, you know, there's, there's always been this dream within the, the advanced computing world that when I hire a physicist or a geologist or a, an aerospace engineer or anyone at the PhD level in a subject matter, that they're gonna be able to know how to program an HPC that you know, I can grab a geophysicist who's gonna be able to write you know, the next great oil reservoir modeling simulation that's going to run on my 150,000 core HPE server um, with no intervention from the outside world. That's never gonna happen, that never happens. Uh, you just can't get subject matter experts to be the kind of programmers that really are, re are required to optimize performance on some of these large systems. And so this one particular oil and gas company we work closely with, they, they have respected this fact and they have a, a, a basically a system where the first thing they do is when you come in and you are a PhD level physicist or geologist or um, someone who, who really understands the, the oil sector from a technology perspective, you know, they expect that you're probably going to be about as proficient as MATLAB as anything else. And so they say, go, please go write your MATLAB code, go do what you need to do and then turn that over to our programming staff who are experts in taking those kinds of programs and converting them into running on uh, our, our large HPCs. And so they've kind of given up on the dream of you know, an end-to-end -end capability. And they understand that you can't get a lot of physical scientists to, to really think about optimizing their programs for running on HPC. But what they do is they do take it a step further. They try to rotate those experts in into the compute center for six month stints to look at certain projects or to at least try to kick the tires to understand and get appreciation for how they can think about their algorithms so they're most amenable to HPC architectures. What are the things that work well on an HPC? You know, things like locality of reference and you know, obscene parallelism, um, you know, um, basically making sure that data is supposed to be loaded or stored in an organized fashion so, so your CPUs aren't sitting around, making them perhaps GPU friendly by tweaking the algorithm. So what they do is at some level, they try to drive into the, um, their, their, their subject matter experts some sense of what matters from a programming level. They don't become expert, but at least they're cognizant of some of the major traits that'll make their programs run more effectively. I think that particular model is the one that's going to be most useful when it comes to the quantum computing world as well, that you're going to have to respect the fact that most of your subject matter experts are not going to come in knowing how to program any kind of quantum computing application. And you're going to need those, those bridge experts who can talk to the quantum computing, advanced computing staff, and talk to those subject matter experts. But you want to at least imbue in those quantum, those, those subject matter experts, some sense about what matters. What are the trade-offs? What are the opportunities and challenges if you're using your quantum system? And I really think that if once, once some of these end users accept the fact that you're not going to, every time we go, I go to a, a workforce discussion in advanced computing, someone always says, we should make every science PhD take at least two semesters of 
of advanced computing programs. And I've heard that since 1981, and it's just not going to happen. People's, people's programs are too packed, and, and quite frankly, it's too hard to make efficient HPC programmers out of scientists, their, their efforts are best used elsewhere. And I think that's hopefully how the quantum computing world is, is going to, 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 um, to roll out. Someone asked about superposition, simultaneous computing, references. Um, the, to me, one of the best places to start, I, you know, there are so many different sites out there. The one, if you're really interested in this, and I mean really interested, um, MIT has a four course intro to quantum computing. I think they're actually starting up the next session in a couple of weeks. And it starts out with some fundamental physics and just runs entirely through all the things you need to know about building quantum computers, uh, some, of the, some of the realities, uh, applications. Uh, there's large sections on some of the error correction activities I talked about. You get to run programs on the IBM Q experience. You watch amazing videos. You actually get to see Peter Shore who is just so brilliant, um, it's scary, uh, lecture on, on some of his, the algorithms that he's developed. Um, but there are, an, this is a, an MIT program that I simply cannot recommend highly enough. If you're very interested in, in learning more about this, a little more than what's in depth, um, a little bit more than what you'd get if you just went to a website. But places like uh, the IBM Q experience has some really good tutorial information. A lot of the vendors have some very good tutorial information. Oddly enough, the book I'm reading right now, I'll just hold it up, which is called Dancing with Qubits, um, which I really like. Uh, it was written by a guy named Bob Suter, who is head of um, basically quantum computing development at IBM. It's an eminently accessible book. I'm a, a, an electrical engineer by trade. And um, so my math is not always as good as it should be for some of this quantum stuff, but there are some really good tutorials and books out there for you to do that. And I would just, I would just start Googling around and look at, at, at some different places that offer those opportunities because there's so many and there's, there's so many that I wouldn't, I'm just looking at, you know, if I, if I pull up my Firefox, I probably got 20 tabs open right now on, in terms of different places I go to kind of, answer some questions I have about quantum computing specifically. Um, there's so many different ways to go that just, just Google and start looking. Um, I, I, if, again, if you send me some, some questions specifically, I can give you some more answers about that. Um, oh yeah, uh, can you comment on China's claim that their quantum computer is 10 billion X faster? Uh, this, I, I love this one because th that recent development that came out of China was clearly one that demonstrated a very interesting but completely useless application that did nothing more than basically it was, it was a purpose-built system uh, that, that used basically photons to demonstrate a single phenomena that more or less demonstrates a Gaussian distribution. Um, and, and, and so it was something that, yes, is intractable on a classical computer, but this was more or less a simulation. And I don't want to trivialize the results because they were interesting and people are always looking for proof of concepts, but it's almost like saying, which is easier to do? Build a, a, a Plinko machine that you drop a ball on the top and it hits some things and falls down to the bottom and you, you chart exactly where the balls fit in the slots. Is it easy to build a Plinko machine or simulate a, pl a Plinko machine on a computer? And guess which one runs fastest when you're trying to do it, the simulation or the actual system. And at some level, what was done in China was an interesting experiment in terms of that Plinko machine, but it was really nothing more than that. It, just, it was a purpose-built system that demonstrated a particular physical phenomena in an interesting way that you just can't simulate on a quantum system. And this goes back in essence to the original Feynman quote that talked about the fact, because people, people talk about Feynman saying he, invent, he, he proposed the first quantum computer. And what he really proposed was he said, quantum computing is hard. And so if you wanna simulate quantum systems, you should use a quantum computer. And he meant use a quantum computer as a simulator. It wasn't use it as a calculator to simulate. And so what we, what we get in a lot of these cases is the idea that this quantum simulator did that. It simulated a quantum phenomena by being a quantum system. 
And so that's a little perspective. It, it, it didn't do anything practical. It was a purpose-built system, and it just demonstrated the capability to basically split photons in an interesting way with a certain degree of, of accuracy. But beyond that, it wasn't anything that clearly was a proof of concept that demonstrated generality or wide range applicability uh, in, within the quantum world. Uh, that's, that's a cautionary tale uh, in many cases. You'll see a lot of that stuff when it comes to demonstrations of random number generations and such, where it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but at the same time, it doesn't have a lot of practical ability. So the sec this, is, this is part of my little diatribe about the sector demonstrating progress in a way that doesn't actually have much applicability to the kind of users. Oh, the name of the book I held up was Dancing with Qubits by Robert Souter. Um, it's really good. Um, I, 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 I've, I've spoken to him about it a few times and it, it almost reads like a mystery novel because the first third of the book gives you fundamental algorithm discussion in the classical world. And I keep saying it's like a mystery because I don't know why you're telling me all these things. I'm waiting for the next step when you actually uh, give me insights as to why I learned all this stuff when we get to the quantum world. But it lays a good foundation in for some of the theoretical underpinnings of what's going on. Um, Someone asked about opinion on Google TPUs, tensor processing units. Are they a game changer in quantum simulation or machine learning? You know, it's interesting. Um, in, the, in the old days, and we're talking you know, like five or six years ago, you know, if you wanted to build a microprocessor, it was hard to do. You know, you, you had to lay out billions of transistors and you had to have a semiconductor production line and, and um, you had to verify and validate and test and there wasn't a lot of variety out there. And with the emergence of silicon foundries, companies like TSMC and Samsung, uh, it seems like anybody nowadays can build a custom chip to meet their particular performance requirements. Um, you know, am I dealing with data intensive operations? Am I just doing a fast Fourier transform? Am I just doing matrix multiplication? Um, you know, what is my particular reproducible application or process or operation that I do very frequently that if I, can, if I can optimize a custom chip for that, I can do it very well. And that has become, in some sense, almost the new way to build chips. And so we see things like, like Google building TPUs, Google building uh, custom chips for their own uh, systems on chips for their own data centers. Uh, the idea now is that if you, if you can have a workload that is reproducible enough and widespread enough that it's worth the investment, you can go out and have a custom chip built. You can either design it yourself or you can pay a design house to take your specifications, design it and turn it over to TSMC or Samsung and you can, ha you can have those chips shortly. So the whole idea right now of custom, uh, you know, tensor processing units, units that are specifically geared towards doing specific uh, deep learning algorithms, uh, you know, uh, dense neural networks and the likes. Uh, if you've got the workload to, to, that demands those particular chips, then you're in a very, very sweet spot. And so uh, the sector right now is really looking at how do I define the workloads I need? How do I define the operations that support those workloads? And is it worth the money and the price performance payoff to go implement those? And we're seeing that more and more across the sector now of really custom. Uh, I, to me, even, it, it, it's interesting that even Intel, you know, the kind of the champion of uh, Intel will you, sell you any variations of the SKUs that they offer are now moving to this chiplet concept where the microprocessor you buy from them may have 20 or 30 different units within that single chip produced by different manufacturers at different process nodes for different things. There may be an image processor, there may be CPUs, there may be an inference engine in there, and you decide all those things, and they just build within that single processor uh, a, a composite uh, component that, that you can more or less custom design. So even Intel, which is in theory, you know, a, a commodity processor house, not a foundry like TSMC or Samsung, is moving to that architecture as well. So to me, the idea that if you've got the component and the workload that you want, you can go out there and really, really understand, um, you know, uh, what, what you need to do to go build that. Um, I will tell you, I'm, I think I've, 
I don't know. I, I hope I've run out of questions. I know I've run out of voice at this particular time. I didn't intend to go on this long, but um, there were lots of good questions. Uh, let me throw up my email address one more time, because if I didn't get to your question or if I gave you a really crummy answer, call me out on that and, and you know, let me let me know and give me the opportunity to perhaps address it in a little more detail. Um, and, and such. But otherwise, I'm going to stop talking now and let people uh, get on with their lives. I want to thank all the folks who hung around till the end uh, to hear me talk. And I hope that this was useful. And that once again, I really do want to thank uh, the, 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 the meetup group um, for uh, inviting me to the Washington area meetup of this. I don't know how many folks were folks or people come from. I, I, I'm hoping that this is more than just just D.C., and that we have some international players as well. And if we do, I live right outside of Washington. And, and so I will tell you that um, for those of us, for those of you who come from outside the United States, uh, I'd just like to personally apologize for the last four years. Uh, and, I, and I hope that things uh, are better going forward from the DC perspective. But, but thank you very much. I appreciate everyone spending their time.